Hello, everybody. Welcome to The Voice of Faith. Having your Bibles this morning. Let's open them, please, to the book of Matthew, chapter 8. And welcome to part 3 in our series entitled Authority. Matthew, chapter 8. This is becoming the foundation for this series, and that's okay. Every time I go over it, God brings out new things to me. So that's good. Matthew chapter 8, verse 5 through 13. Word of God never gets old. If it's old and boring to you, come see me. <laughs> come see us. <laughs> like someone once said, if you're, if you're uh, not on fire, your wood's wet. <laughs> Matthew chapter 8, verse 5. When Jesus was entered into Capernaum, there came unto him a centurion beseeching him. And saying, Lord, well, the Holy Spirit just spoke to me. All right. The Lord wants us to read this. He wants me to read it slow and for us to do our very best to read this as if it was our very first time. Okay? And when Jesus was entered into Capernaum, there came unto him a centurion, beseeching him, and saying, Lord, my servant lieth at home, sick of the palsy, grievously tormented. Jesus said unto him, I will come and heal him. The centurion answered and said, Lord, I'm not worthy that thou shouldest come under my roof. But speak the word only, and my servant shall be healed. I'm not worthy that thou shouldest come under my roof. Now, why would he say that? Why would he say to come under my roof? How many of you growing up like I did, my parents had a saying that as long as you're in my house, you're going to abide by my rules, Amen. right? If you're going to eat at my table, and if I'm going to put clothes on your back, if, as long as you're living under my roof, you're going to obey my rules, Right? So when this centurion said, Lord, I, I don't, I'm not worthy for you to come under my roof, what he was saying is, I don't need you to come under my authority. To come under my roof is to come under my authority. When I lived under my parents' roof, I was living under their authority. Amen. And this man is saying, I don't need you to come under my roof to come under my authority. I'm not worthy for that. Here's what I'm asking. Speak the word only, and my servant shall be healed. For I'm a man under authority with soldiers under me, and I say to this man, Go, and he goeth, to another come, and he cometh, and to my servant do this, and he doeth it. When Jesus heard it, he marveled and said to them that followed, Verily I say unto you, I have not found so great faith, no, not in Israel. And then verse 13, Jesus said unto the centurion, Go thy way, and as thou hast believed, so be it done unto thee, and his servant was healed in the self-same hour. We have looked at this centurion, and we have noted that he wasn't a choir boy. He wasn't a preacher. He wasn't home studying his Bible and praying in tongues for eight hours a day. This guy was a Roman soldier. He was used to death. He was used, used, to, uh, used to cruelty. He was used to seeing a lot of blood. And not, not only was he a Roman soldier, he had Roman soldiers underneath him. This guy was a commander. He was a Rambo. <laughs> All right, he was an Arnold Schwarzenegger. This guy was rough and tough. He was not a softy, fuzzy kind of guy at all. And we find here that it's so wonderful and so interesting and amazing that you can find true faith in the most strangest of places. And of all places, you would not think that true faith would be in a Roman soldier, would not be in a Roman centurion. But the Roman centurion had great faith because he understood the principles of authority. Faith and authority go together. Faith and authority go together. Let's talk about authority here for a moment. We've mentioned that our society is becoming more and more confused. The home life is breaking down because people are not recognizing authority. They're not submitting to authority, but they're getting away from it. Uh, it it's now it's, it's in vogue to... Uh, rail against those in authority, to speak against them, to mock them, to make fun of them. And uh, we question everything, and we, we live in a society that's very rebellious. 
you know, this is not the Waltons anymore. This is not uh, John Boy. This is not Little House on the Prairie. We live in a crazy mixed up society and the touch point is authority. And people want nothing to do with it and they want to rebel against it. And that's a dangerous place to be in. Amen? So you have people who are against authority, want nothing to do with it, but then you have some who have a, a soft heart, a tender heart, and they, they have some concept of authority and submitting to it, but since they don't know enough, the devil does a switcheroo on them, and he makes people feel responsible for things they're not responsible for. Let me, let me show you by, by this. The devil gives people a false sense of, I'm responsible for so-and-so. I'm responsible for this situation. I'm responsible for, for this person. And in reality, they're not. And here's how you can tell where your responsibility ends and where it begins. Your responsibility ends where your authority ends. You're not responsible for somebody that you don't have authority over. It would be unfair for God to, to give you responsibility that exceeded your authority. That would be unfair of Him. That would be unjust. That would be cruel because that would put a burden on you that you've got to take care of this area. You've got to take care of this person, but you don't have the authority to do it. God's not like that. And the other thing is also true, God will never give you authority that exceeds your responsibility because then you, be, you could become a tyrant. So the level of your responsibility, whatever the sphere, whatever the, the, the dimensions of your, your responsibility, that's your authority. Where your responsibility ends, that's where your authority ends. So you're only responsible for things that you have authority over you only have authority for things you're responsible for. Saying the same thing, two different sides of the same coin. So if you know somebody that's struggling with a false sense of responsibility and you're trying to get them to wake up, say to them, ask them, do you have authority over them? Do you have authority over that person? Do you have authority over that situation? Can you say something and rearrange and change it? Uh, do you have the authority to say something and for them to listen and, and obey you? Well, no. Well, then you're not responsible for them. It's dangerous to try and take responsibility for something you have no authority over. It's also dangerous to try to take authority over something you're not responsible for. Please say this. Say authority, authority. And, responsibility and responsibility go together. Go together. So you can tell when God's increasing your authority because he's increasing your responsibility. Can you say amen or take notes at the same time? Amen. <laughs> so you are only responsible for what you have authority over. Have you ever heard someone say, well, and I, I've, I've, heard, I've had people actually say this to me, well, I'll tell you what, I, I, I submit to God, but I don't submit to any man. You ever heard that one? I've had that told me more than once as a pastor. I submit to man, but I don't, su I submit to God, but I don't submit to any man. Well, you've got a major problem then. <laughs> because if you don't submit to man, then you're not submitted to God. We don't just work with God, we also work with people. Amen. And God works with people and he works through people. And to say, well, I, I rebel against authority. I'm not, I'm not, I, don't, I refuse to submit to any man. I just submit to God. That's, that's fantasy land. That's totally, totally not going to work for you. Let me give you a nugget here. I'm going to ask you to write this down. This is really, really powerful, I believe. Something worth your time and meditation. You cannot have, a thought, you, pardon me, you cannot have faith in God's word and not respect authority. You cannot have faith in God's word and not respect authority. I think that's a good statement. You cannot have faith in God's word and not respect authority. All of a sudden, next week's message is wanting to rise up within me about 
submitting at home to your parents, and that's where authority begins, but we'll talk about that next week. <laughs> you cannot have faith in God's Word and not respect authority. How can, you, how can you believe in this book and submit to God's authority when He has set up authority of men? It, it doesn't jive. They go together, right? All right, praise God. God has a structure of authority. And how you handle authority says a lot about you. Says a lot about you. I've been wanting to say this for a long time. I get these little nuggets. I have to wait till the right message comes along to put them in. Spiritual sins are greater in God's eyes than fleshly sins. Spiritual sins are greater in God's eyes than fleshly sins. The world has gravitated toward physical sins. Adultery, you know, all the, all the sexual areas, drinking, smoking, cussing, doping, you know, all of that. The, whole, the church world has just gravitated toward physical fleshly sins. And obviously we're not promoting them. <laughs> We, we don't need to do that. However, the, in God's eyes, spiritual sins are greater than physical fleshly sins. How many here has heard the statement, well, sin is sin. All sins are the same. That's not true. That is not true. The Bible does place in category sins. Some sins are greater and worse than other sins. That's why you have the word transgression, sin, and iniquity in the Bible. It's not just all lumped into just sin. You have transgression, you have sin, and you have iniquity. And in those, God gives us different areas that tells us that some sins are greater than others. And spiritual sins are greater than fleshly sins. Are you listening to me? Spiritual sins would be... I'm not going to give you a full list. I'm just going to throw some out for you to kind of get a concept, an idea of what we're talking about here, about spiritual sins. Spiritual sins would be rebellion against authority. Spiritual sins would be envy and jealousy. Things that deal more with your heart. You know, I believe with all my heart that there are Christians who love God, they're doing everything they can, but they're addicted to cigarettes. And they're addicted, and some of them, you know, hey, I don't want to be set free. I enjoy it. I enjoy a Marlboro. But they love God with all their heart. That's a fleshly sin. Their flesh is addicted to it. But if you take a Christian who has no, none of those addictions, but he's rebellious against authority. Nobody can correct him. Nobody can tell him what to do. Those spiritual sins are greater in God's eyes than the guy over here puffing a Marlboro. And we need a lot of teaching about spiritual sins and what they are and why they're greater in God's sight and why they have greater consequences than just puffing on a Marlboro. Hmm? Unforgiveness is a huge spiritual sin. Thank you. Unforgiveness is a huge, it's a major spiritual sin. Thank you, babe. For those of you listening to this message, babe was my wife. <laughs> Just want to get that clear. All right. Let's go to Joel chapter 2 for a moment. Hold your place in Matthew, and we'll come back there. I guess I need to do the same thing. Joel chapter 2. Daniel, Daniel, Hosea, Joel 2. I wish I had time to read more of these verses here, but for sake of time we've got other things to do. Joel chapter 2. We're dealing with authority. And we're going to break this down and help you out here a little bit better, I believe. Joel 2, 7. They shall run like mighty men. They shall climb the wall like men of war. 
And they shall march every one on his ways, and they shall not break their ranks. That's very important. Neither shall one thrust another. They shall walk every one in his path. And when they fall upon the sword, they shall not be wounded. This is part of a description in this chapter about the army of God. There is a difference between the family of God and the army of God. You're going to like this. There's a difference between the family of God and the army of God. In the family of God, we all have equal redemptive rights. In the family of God, we all have equal redemptive rights. I call it ERA, equal redemption for all. <laughs> equal redemption for all. We all have the blood of Jesus. We're in the family of God. We're all healed, saved, filled with the Spirit. All, all blessings that belong to you belong to me. All blessings that belong to me belong to you. We have equal redemption all across the board in the family of God. In the family of God, we're all equal. In the family of God, we're all loved the same. We're all loved the same by the Father. By the Son and the Holy Ghost. God does not look at Terry and love her more than he does me. Right? He doesn't look at me and love me any more than he does Sister Karen. When he looks at us as his children, he's got love in his eyes for every single one of us. His heart beats the same for every one of us because we are his kids. Right? We're the family of God. We're his children. He, God Almighty is our Father. In the army of God, it's different. In the army of God, we all have different levels of authority. In the family of God, we all have different levels of authority, which means different levels of responsibility. We have different abilities and different benefits. In the, in the army of God, we all have different levels of authority, responsibility, ability, and benefits. So there's a big difference between the family of God and the army of God. Let me give you a, a great illustration here. There's a father who has three sons, and all of them are in the army. The father is a general. The oldest son is a captain. The middle son is a sergeant, and the youngest is a private. When they are at home, they do not salute one another in the hallway. But when they're on the battlefield, there's no clowning around. There's no asking questions. It is taking orders and saying, yes, sir. There's a difference between the family of God and the army of God. At home, man, it's dad and, and his three sons. They're palling around. They're clowning around. They're having fun. But once they go out on the battlefield, it's different. And we need to have in our mind this understanding that the family of God is one thing. The army of God is something else. We come in as family, but there are many times when church starts, we flip over to army of God. It's important that we respect each other as family members, but it's also important that we respect each other in our rank in the army of God. And it's wrong to have my buddy and try to influence him as my friend to get me in a position because he's higher in rank than I am. Hey, you think you could get me a meeting with so-and-so? You know, I took you out last week in McAllister's and it was my treat. <laughs> Could you get me a meeting with so-and-so? And that happens a lot in the family of God, but it's wrong because we're also the army of God. Wheels are turning. Thank you, Lord. The army of God doesn't break rank. The army of God doesn't break rank. 
In the army of God, we so understand authority and submission to authority, delegated authority, ex, ex, uh, uh, what's the word I want to use here? Executing orders, being obedient. Okay, this is the last time I'm going to talk about this, but I'm going to use this as an illustration, and then I'm done, because I'm not going to give the devil any place. When you're in the army of God, God will assign you a position. And if you don't like that position, you can ask for a transfer, or you can do what I had maybe planned on doing about three weeks ago. I was going to go AWOL. I was just going to leave. We had a real successful church picnic. And Sunday morning, we had that many people show up for church. And I thought, we're three and a half years into this church, and only that many people show up. And it got to me. And it hardly ever does. I, I'm not affected most of the time by numbers. just doesn't. But boy, that Sunday, it just really got to me. So I went home and was like, man, this is disgusting. This church is a sham. It's a shame. It's a disgrace against the body of Christ. I'm just going to pack my bags and go back to Illinois. I'm done. And the Lord said, you better stop. You better stop. You better stop it right now. You better get a hold of this. And I didn't. I kept on going, kept on going. The Lord said, you better stop. I wasn't asking for a transfer. I was just AWOL. I was just going, man. I was leaving. <laughs> I didn't say, sir, can I put in a request for transfer? Because I knew it would have come back denied, so I didn't want to talk about that. <laughs> so usually when I allow an emotional attack and I yield to it, I usually get a physical attack later on. And, uh, man, I didn't put up my faith, Duke, so I didn't even put my gloves on. <laughs> I was nothing. I was just, just taking the beating, you know. And so... I told Leanne, I said, I'm going to bed. She goes, it's 8 o'clock. I said, yeah, I'm just going to go to bed. Tomorrow will be a better day. So I laid in bed and contemplated leaving and going to Illinois. Because this church is just a, it's a disgrace. Showed up for church that Sunday. Can't believe it. So I woke up Monday morning. I thought, well, the game plan is to mow my yard and get my yard work done. So I'm mowing my yard. And man, I get attacked in my heart. I just, I don't know if it was a heart attack or what, but I'm having a difficult time. So I quit. I come in. I can't breathe. I'm hurting bad. And Leanne prays for me. And I'm like, oh, man, I should have dealt, dealt with this yesterday. I thought it was just going to be a cold or a flu. You know, Lord, I repent. She's praying and I'm repenting without her knowing I'm repenting. So the pain starts going away. And Leanne says, you need to go activate your faith. You need to go walk out your faith. And I look up, and there's the lawnmower. It's like, I do not want to go mow the yard. I want to take a shower, and I want to go to bed and believe for my healing. <laughs> <laughs> you need to go walk out your faith, exercise your faith. So there's that lawnmower. So all right. So I went outside, and I finished mowing the yard, got the leaf blower, and cleaned the front yard and the back, did everything I was supposed to do. When you are in the army of God and God has placed you in a position, there are consequences if you leave and go AWOL. I should have asked for a transfer. Would have come back denied. And I should have said, yes, sir. Thank you, sir. I'll stay faithful to my post. Family of God, man, we love one another. It's awesome. It's great. But when it comes to the army of God, we have responsibility and we have authority. Amen? All right, hallelujah. So the army of God doesn't break rank, and that's what I was planning on doing. <laughs> and, and you know, one of, my, one of the thoughts that I had during that time was, well, where are the people going to go? And that made me mad. It's like, where are they going to go? I don't want to think about where, they, where they're going to go. Where are they going to go? I don't want to think about where they're going to go. I just want to leave. I'm done. This many people showed up for church. Where are they going to go if you quit? I don't want to think about that. Lord, just leave me alone. You better get a hold of it. Aren't you glad that he loves us enough to discipline us? Amen. Amen. No, he did not. He did not bring that on me. I opened the door for the enemy to come in and attack me. 
It wasn't God's fault. It was mine for not putting up my dukes. And so what happens, it was either Monday or Tuesday, this turkey <laughs> sends me a text, put up your dukes. Thanks a lot. <laughs> Thanks a lot. Put up your dukes. I don't need to hear my own sermon, all right? <laughs> all right. Let's go back to Matthew 8. Matthew chapter 8. So having authority is wonderful, but you balance it out with responsibility. Matthew chapter 8. Look at verse 9, please. For I am a man under authority, having soldiers under me. Would you please say this after me? I am under authority, I am under authority. And, I have authority. and I have authority. I am under authority, I am under authority. And, I and I have authority. I am under authority, I am under authority. And, I authority. and I have authority. That is an excellent balance right there. Notice that this man first identified with the fact that he was under authority, and then he brought up that he had authority. That's a good confession right there. I am under authority, and I have authority. Watch this verse. For I am a man under authority, having soldiers, say soldiers, soldiers. under me. And I say to this man, go, and he goeth, and to another, come, and he cometh. And to my servant, do this, and he doeth it. So this man didn't just have soldiers under him. He had at least one servant under him. This man who had authority had two things underneath him. He had soldiers and servants, or at least a servant, under him. As a believer, well, I'm getting ahead of myself. No, I'm not. As a believer, do you have authority? Amen. If so, don't answer out loud, and it's not a trick question. I want you to think about this. Do you have authority? If so, then who is your servant? Who, think, don't, don't answer out loud, who is your servant? We have authority. Who is our servant? Read with me, please, in the book of Luke, chapter 17. Here's our answer. Luke 17, verse number 5. The apostles said unto the Lord, Increase our faith. And the Lord said, If ye had faith as a grain of mustard seed, ye might say unto the sycamine tree, Be thou plucked up by the root, and be thou planted in the sea, and it should obey you. So when the disciples asked the Lord to increase our faith, I want you to notice what he did not do. He said, All right, Peter. I'm going to lay my hands on you. Here's some more faith. Jesus did not give him more faith by laying hands on him. I want you to notice what Jesus didn't do when they said, Lord, increase our faith. He didn't say, okay, Peter, John, in, the na in, in my name, have more faith. He didn't say that. He didn't lay hands on them. He didn't say that to them. What he did say was, if you had faith as a grain of mustard seed, you might say unto this sycamine tree, be thou plucked up by the root, and be thou planted in the sea, and it should obey you. That kind of like of a strange answer. Watch this. Read verse 5 and skip 6 to verse 7. The apostles said unto the Lord, Increase our faith. But which of you, having a servant, plowing or feeding cattle, will say unto him by and by when he come in from the field, Go and sit down to meet? Faith is your servant. Faith is the servant of the believer. He gave two, two examples, two answers 
to increase our faith. The first one was he talked about a seed. And the second one was he talked about a servant. Increase our faith. The answer is use your servant. Use your servant. You have him, use him. You and I have authority over the faith of God. You and I have authority over the faith of God. Boy, I just blew the door open for a whole lot of folks right there. There's like, that's a whole new level. That's a whole new understanding for me. You mean I got a servant all this time and he's been sitting around? That's what I'm saying. <laughs> you have authority and your servant is faith. Faith is the servant of the believer. Let's read through this again. The apostles said unto the Lord, increase our faith. The Lord said, if ye had faith as a grain of mustard seed, ye might say unto the sycamine tree, be thou plucked up by the root, and be thou planted in the sea, and it should obey you. But which of you, having a servant plowing or feeding cattle, will say unto him by and by, when he has come in from the field, go and sit down to meat? And will not rather say unto him, Make ready wherewith I may sup, and gird thyself, and serve me, till I have eaten and drunken, and afterward thou shalt eat and drink. Doth he thank that servant, because he did the things that were commanded him? I trow not, which means I think not. So likewise ye, when ye shall have done all those things which are commanded you, say, We are unprofitable servants, we have done that which is our duty to do. It's our duty to live by faith. We're not doing anything special or extraordinary by living the faith life. It's our duty. It's every born-again Christian's duty to live by faith. Now watch what he says here concerning the servant, concerning faith. He uses this, um, verse 7, But which of you having a servant plowing are feeding cattle, and then he talks about eating. This is, this is good stuff. Plowing represents your future. Plowing represents your future. Feeding the cattle represents today. And to sup, to eat, deals with your immediate need, your right now need. Oh, this is so good. Thank you, Lord. Faith is your servant. Faith, your servant faith is going into your future. It's plowing your field, going into your future to give you a harvest six months or a year from now. Faith is providing for you today, and faith is providing your immediate need. I've been saying this over the last few weeks, clowning around, and God will set me up. I've been teasing people about being at, being, uh, at more than one place at, at one time. You know, we've never figured out how to do that. We can only be at one place at one time. But guess what? You don't need to be at more than one place at one time because your servant faith can be at more than one place at one time. Amen. Mm, thank you, Jesus. Your faith is going into your future, preparing for you. Your faith right now is outside that door, working on your day today when you leave here. And your faith is feeding you a good supper right now. Mm. Mm. Thank you, Lord. So how do we increase our faith? The answer is, Work it. Work it. Work that servant. And when he's done in the field, he's going to come home. Do you say to that servant, Oh, you've been working out in the field. You're so hot and sweaty. Here, you sit down and let me take care. No, no. You tell your servant, All right, you're, you've been working in the field. You're coming out and sweaty. You still take care of me and you feed me first. Then you go take care of you. Right? But you still need to feed your servant. If you don't feed him, eventually, you're not going to have one because <laughs> you'll work him to death. So how do you increase your faith? You feed it and you work it because it's your servant. Uh, 
That's a wonderful concept. To think about that you have a servant called faith. And you have authority over him. And he will do what you tell him to do. Thank you, Lord. Romans chapter 12. Romans 12 and 3. And I'm in Corinthians. That's not going to work, Brother Phil. Romans 12. Romans 12 and 3. Some of you may have this marked. For I say through the grace given unto me to every man that is among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think soberly according as God hath dealt to every man the measure of faith. We emphasize the fact that it's the measure and not a measure. Why? Well, because the Bible says the, but here's another reason why. When you were born again... God gave you the servant faith. We all have been given the same servant. You received the servant faith the day you were born again. Now, if your, if your servant is at home lying on the couch, <laughs> taking a vacation, and he's been eating Fritos for the last 40 years... You need to tell him it's time to get up off the couch and get to work. Right? you got a servant. You have authority. Let's use him. Look at chapter 10. Romans 10, 17. So then faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. So then the servant faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. When you hear the word, the servant faith comes and is ready to be put to work. And then God said this to me. He says, how he is dressed depends upon what scriptures you're listening to. And I just had a picture of a servant, faith, and he's standing there with a surgeon's gown, a mask, and a scalpel in his hands. Then I saw another picture of a servant, and he's standing there with overalls, a hard hat, and he's got a, a, a jackhammer. And then I saw another servant, Faith, and he's standing there, and he's got on a tuxedo, and he's, got, and he's a waiter. All right? What do you need your servant to do? He's going to come to you dressed with whatever scriptures you're listening to. Now, now watch this. Faith cometh by hearing. Brother, would you stand up? Just stand up and, and just quote a scripture that comes to your mind. Any, any scripture? Any scripture. Uh, faith is the, the substance of things uh, hoped for and evidence of the things not seen. Okay. Faith heard that and faith cometh. Every time you speak the word of God, your servant faith is listening, and he comes. What would you like for me to do, sir? Mow his lawn. Yeah, yeah. I'm looking for that scripture, brother. Can't find that in old King Jimmy at all. Do you see that? Faith, your servant, comes as you hear, as you speak the word. And then as it comes, it's ready to be assigned its duty. Amen. You have authority over the faith of God. Amen. Praise God. Let's read Mark eleven twenty two twenty three. 23. Classic. Classic faith scriptures. Jesus answering saith unto them, Have faith in God. For verily I say unto you, That whosoever shall say unto this mountain, Be thou removed and be thou cast into the sea, Shall not doubt in his heart, But shall believe that those things which he saith Shall come to pass, 
he shall have whatsoever he saith. You do not remove the mountains of your life. That's your servant faith's job. The pressure, the responsibility is not on you to remove your mountains. You speak and faith gets to push in that mountain out of the way and faith will push it and push it until it goes in the sea. That's why after you've given the faith command, <laughs> after you've given the faith command, you can go to sleep because my servant's working. That mountain's being pushed into the sea. Oh, thank you, Lord. I have authority over my servant faith and it's working. And I'm just going to go to sleep thinking about my beautiful wife. Right? Faith is rest. Why am I resting? Because my servant is working. Amen. Hallelujah. Oh, praise God. All right, Proverbs 18. You enjoying this? Proverbs 18. Say, I am under authority. And I have authority. I have authority over the faith of God. It's my servant. Okay, we need to get a little serious. In Proverbs 18, 21... Death and life are in the power of the tongue, and they that eat it shall eat the fruit thereof. Now, we just read in Luke about telling your servant, plowing, taking care of the cattle, and then coming in, and you take care of me, and let me sup, let me eat, and then you can eat, right? Death and life are in the power of the tongue. They that love it shall eat the fruit thereof. Out of all of the things that I've studied on authority, one of the phrases that means the most to me is this right here. Your words are your authority. Your words are your authority. Your words are your authority. What you say you are authorizing to happen in your life. That's powerful. That's, that's sober. What you say you are authorizing to happen in your life. Every word we say is important. Every word we say is important. Because life and death is in the power of the tongue. I want you to think of your words. Every word you say, I want you to picture it like this. Your words are a container. And whatever substance is in that container, you're going to spill out on people. You're going to spill out life or death. You're going to spill out faith or doubt and unbelief. You're going to spill out over someone blessing or cursing. Your words are containers. And you're authorizing what you say to happen in your life. And your words affect other people's life. By way of simple illustration, if I took this bottle of water and I splashed it on my sister, it would affect her. And this water is cold. She might shout a little bit. It won't, uh, it won't, uh, it won't affect her permanently, but our words can go down deep in someone. Amen. And we can break someone's spirit or we can bring healing to them. Every word we say is important. And Jesus said in Matthew 12, by your words you'll be justified and by your words you'll be condemned. Your words are so important. You're speaking here, but your words go into your future to rearrange what you said and make it happen. Your words are so powerful and your authority is so great. Your words not only go into your future, your words go all the way into eternity and they're waiting on you. 
And when you get to eternity, you'll be judged by your words. You got words on the other side waiting for you. We will be held accountable for our authority and what we authorized in our lives. With authority comes responsibility. The number one way authority is exercised is by words. The number one way authority is exercised is by words. And we see that so clearly in Matthew 8 with the centurion. And we see it in other places as well. As well. The number one way authority is exercised is by words. The second way authority is exercised is by action. It wasn't enough that my wife spoke healing over me. It wasn't enough that I spoke healing. I had to act out my faith because our body has authority. And what we do with our body releases that authority. And so your actions have to be in conjunction with your words. You can't say one thing and do another, right? Okay? Look at Proverbs chapter 6, please. Proverbs 6. Proverbs 6 and 2. We're just about through. Proverbs 6, 2 says, Thou art snared with the words of thy mouth. Thou art taken with the words of thy mouth. What is a snare? It's a trap. Yeah, it's a trap. Okay? If you are trapped by your words, then you can be made free by your words. If you have trapped yourself with your words, you don't need a preacher to pray for you. You just need to change your speech and you can set yourself free because your words are your authority. That's a strong scripture, isn't it? Amen. Say this with me. Say, my words, my words are my authority. Are my, authority. My, words my words are my authority. My words, my words are my authority. Proverbs chapter 12. Proverbs 12 and 6. Most people, the vast majority of, of the world, the vast majority of sinners, the vast majority of Christians do not understand the power and the importance of words. There is a select group of people in the sinner realm that knows the power of words. Uh, someone who does a number one hit record, someone who writes songs, becomes a multimillionaire because of one song, don't go up to him and say, words just aren't important, words don't matter. Don't, don't go up to Stephen King and tell him words don't matter. An author knows that words are important. Don't ever go up to a lawyer and say, well, pff, words, words don't mean anything. His whole life is based on words. His money his income, his livelihood is based on words. But the vast majority of people do not know the power and the importance of words. And most Christians do not know the power and the importance of words. Because their speech gives them away. I came to a, a certain place, I walked in, and the lady was there, and I said, hi. She goes, hi, how, how are you? I said, great, how are you? She goes, oh man, my sinuses are just killing me. Hmm. You're a born-again Christian. You speak in tongues and your sinuses are killing you. Well, I'm glad we're in a funeral home because it's a real safe place to die. <laughs> she does not know. The church she goes to does not teach her the power and the importance of words. Amen. And she doesn't know that her words are a snare, that she's trapped. About 15 years ago, the devil tried to give me allergies. Just one season, because I had never had problems with them before, but one season. And I stood against that and I said, in the name of Jesus, I'll never have allergies. And I stood against it for like three weeks and that attack broke. I still have no problems with allergies. Your words can trap you or your words can set you free. Your words are your authority. 
Thank you, Lord. Proverbs 12, 6. The words of the wicked are to lie in wait for blood, but the mouth of the upright shall deliver them. Hmm. Look at verse 14. A good man shall be satisfied with good by the fruit of his mouth, and the recompense of a man's hands shall be rendered unto him. The fruit of your mouth. How many of you know that, that it takes time to produce fruit? See, that's why some people don't agree with what we teach, because they think, well, if you say it, then it's like abracadabra, hocus pocus, shazam, it just happens instantly. Sometimes it does, but the vast majority of the time, it's fruit that's born, that grows and is born and comes to fruition over a period of time. And only the wise person, if you ask them, how did you get this way? They can tell you, seven years ago, God gave me these words to say. They know the root because they understand the power of life and death is in the tongue. I'm enjoying the fruit, but there was the root seven years ago. Most people don't have that type of mentality. Chapter 13, verse 3. He that keepeth his mouth keepeth his, keepeth his life. <laughs> That'll stop gossip. He that keepeth his mouth keepeth his life. But he that openeth wide his lips shall have destruction. Chapter 21, verse 23. Proverbs 21, 23. Whoso keepeth his mouth and his tongue keepeth his soul from troubles. <laughs> just about to close. You guys can hang in there with me just five, five more minutes. Somebody, a lot of people believe what I'm about to say to you. Well, you know, the Lord has blessed me with my spouse. And the reason God gave me my spouse is so I can vent. Because everybody just needs to vent. We just need to let it out. And I can just vent. And that's why God gave me my wife, so I can vent. There's something better than venting. It's called not letting it get in to begin with. If you don't let it get in, it won't need to come out. God did not give me my spouse to vent. God gave me my wife so we can pray the prayer of agreement and release our faith. And if we agree together in prayer... The thing that's bothering me, the pressure won't come in because we've released our servant faith to deal with it. If we understood that life and death is in the tongue, that what we say we are authorizing, there's things that we share with our spouse that maybe we shouldn't be sharing with our spouse because it just doesn't need to come out to begin with. Say, I'm under authority, I'm under authority. and I have authority. Our last scripture is Mark 13. You want to do something sobering sometime, go through the book of Proverbs and underline every time it says words, tongue, mouth, lips, and you'll walk away from there on your knees. <laughs> Somebody once said, I've been hung by the tongue. Anybody ever put your foot in your mouth? Some, some people have athlete's tongue. <laughs> That's gross. <laughs> yeah, I shouldn't have said that. That was gross. <laughs> Mark 13, 34. For the Son of Man. Who's that? Jesus. For the Son of Man. <laughs> she used to be more like Jesus every day. That's me. <laughs> Boy, she's taking authority. Yeah, she sure is. My wife's a go-getter. Glory to God. It's tough living with the godly woman. Now I'm living with Jesus. <laughs> I'll never kiss you the same now. <laughs> okay, too bad we can't edit. <laughs> 
Mark 13, 34. For the Son of Man. Who is that? Jesus. Thank you. Thank you. Hallelujah. We give it second chances around here. For the Son of Man is as a man taking a far journey who left his house and gave authority to his servants. Who's that? That's us, right? He gave us authority. I, li I like this. To his servant, and gave authority to his servants and to every man his work. And commanded the porter, which is the Holy Ghost, to watch. God has given you authority to fulfill what you, what, pardon me. God has given you authority to fulfill what work you are called to do. God has given you authority to fulfill what work you are called to do. God has given you authority to fulfill what work you are called to do. Wouldn't it be unfair of God to give you work and not give you the authority to complete it? That would be a responsibility without authority, wouldn't it? Brothers and sisters, you and I are not without authority. You and I are not without a servant. This is a message that needs to be preached to the church. You are not without authority and you are not without a servant. You know what that means? That means we're not helpless. That means we're not hopeless. We have authority and we have a servant. And God has given you authority to do the work he's called you to do. Amen. Thank you so much for listening to the voice of faith today. And until next time we gather around the good word of God, remember these words, be not afraid only believe.